professor at uh, Columbia University, Department of Neurology, and I forget the institute. Tau. Tau. Um, she actually completed her PhD at San Diego 
uh, San Diego State University, the University of California's joint doctoral program in clinical psychology. She was three years ahead of me, I think. So I've always looked up to her. <laughs> um, she did her internship at Brown, uh, her postdoc at Columbia, and she's been there ever since. She has an amazing CV, I think. 195 publications, and we're going to start a little ticker online. <laughs> and, about, and about 30 current NIH grants, or mostly NIH grants, and about 10 of those are PFs. Now. <laughs> so, um, so she's going to in, uh, introduce herself a little bit more publicly, but please help me welcome Dr. Jennifer. Thank you, Steve. It's really great to be here. Um, I uh, I can't wait to see this live streaming on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so I first want to thank. Um, the uh, people who contribute to this research. Um, usually I wait until the last slide to thank people, but really it should come first here. Um, we have built uh, um, a really wonderful group of people that we work with in uh, Washington Heights, the northern part of Manhattan, uh, to do some of our community studies. And um, I'm really fortunate to work with them. We have. Uh, really a, a wonderfully representative group of folks who we've attracted to um, the lab, and I'm really proud of everything they do. So um, I'll be showing you some pictures along the way um, I, I, uh, of people who I've worked with and um, who I have the honor to work with. So um, I'm just going to skip to the end here with my first slide, which is that um, I think that um, the, the overall message of, of my work, and I think something that is uh, getting more attention, um, luckily in the literature, is that social forces are fundamental causes of disparities in brain health, later life brain health. So what do I mean by, um, by social forces? Um, they uh, are uh, uh, forces that, that um, impact a whole host of health outcomes throughout the life course. Um, and uh, they, uh, not, they're not just about um, buffering um, uh, uh, access to resources, but they also may be direct causes of disease. And what's interesting is that um, there's mediators or pathways from social forces to later life health if those um, mediators are intervened on, these social forces will just find some other way to, um, to impact later life health. So it's, um, it was very helpful for Bruce Link and Joe Phelan to um, define these uh, fundamental social forces uh, and, to, um, and to explain sort of how they're reproduced over time, uh, over centuries. So uh, what I'm going to get at in my talk today is first to overview uh, dementia epidemiology just a bit to sh show some evidence of disparities in later life brain health. Um, and I'll talk about some of the evidence for, um, for, for um, uh, disparities in each of, these, each of these outcomes. We have some methodological challenges. I'll focus on um, survival bias and selection bias. And then I'll get into some um, mediators for um, later life brain health. So I'm going to pivot this. Sorry if I'm messing up the feed. Just so I don't have to keep looking behind me. There we go. So um, this, uh, this uh, figure shows the impact of dementia that is we're facing in um, Western and also in uh, low and middle income countries. Um, because of the um, demographic shifts in the number of older people 
in these countries, the burden of age-related cognitive disorders is going to really um, explode. And you can see that while the impact is really um, uh, intense in the high-income countries, it's really going to be um, an issue in low- and middle-income countries. So we are searching for, uh, frantically searching for ways to stem this, um, this future. Um, one of the things to think about is that I showed you just now the impact of the clinical syndrome of um, dementia. Um, this happens to be um, uh, Ron Brookmeyer's um, projections for the impact of preclinical Alzheimer's disease, one sub um, type of dementia. And um, what he's showing here is that the, um, the actual clinical syndromes, <laughs> late, early, and MCI, uh, are uh, relatively, uh, you know, compared to the, the number of people who have amyloid in their brain and the number of people who have neurodegeneration, uh, and also uh, the amyloid in their brain and neurodegeneration, um, uh, is is quite high. So really what we're seeing is, is that these um, brain health factors are a risk factor for later life um, dementia and the impact, uh, uh, the place for intervention um, on these sorts of, um, of brain health outcomes is really earlier in age um, because that's when they start to take hold. So I uh, feel a little silly doing this, but um, I do want to define disparities um, before I go forward. Um, this is um, the, the, the definition that I have, um, that I have chosen, um, which is that um, health disparities are differences in disease prevalence and incidence um, and health outcomes and, um, or, or in access to health, health care between groups. Um, these differences are not just any health difference. They are rooted in social injustice that makes some groups um, more vulnerable um, or um, uh, have a higher burden of disease than others. So by definition, disparities are avoidable. These are the sort of nationally defined um, health disparities populations. Um, so uh, this, these are the, the groups um, that I'll be focusing on today. Uh, some evidence for disparities in Alzheimer's disease. So um, this is um, Wei Ming Watson. She's now a student in um, uh, Steve and I, our, our program in, in San Diego. Um, and while she was at Columbia, she uh, looked at the risk of incidence of Alzheimer's disease in our cohort of people who were following longitudinally in northern Manhattan. These are people who were selected based on being eligible for Medicare in the neighborhoods around the hospital. Um, and so we've shown that this is a representative cohort in Washington Heights of people who are age 65 and older. And we selected all the people who at their baseline visit were not demented. They had no cognitive impairment, no functional impairment. And we followed them over time and looked at um, incidents of, of dementia um, at follow-up. And what we found um, is that um, compared to the reference group, the um, non-Hispanic whites in our sample, um, the non-Hispanic blacks and the Hispanic Latino group um, were at much higher risk for developing um, dementia. Uh, when you restrict the dementia subtype to Alzheimer's disease, the results don't change. Um, when you adjust for years of education, the results don't change. Um, when you adjust for um, occupation or income, this disparity persists. Uh, Elizabeth Rose Maeda um, has also looked at this in another cohort. She is um, uh, did this in the Kaiser Health Study um, uh, in Northern California. So uh, she first took all the people who were in Kaiser who were um, in these older age groups. She did a washout. So that's 10 years prior to the beginning of this study. She took, she took out anybody who had cognitive impairment. Uh, 
and then looked at dementia incidents using the ICD-9 codes for dementia and found that the group that was at lowest risk for developing dementia were uh, people who in the medical charts were identified as Asian American. So those are the reference group in this um, cohort because they're at the lowest risk. Um, the folks who were at the highest risk were the American India, Alaska Native, and the non-Hispanic Black or African American group. Um, and so um, the, uh, she was not able to get years of education from these charts, um, but she was able to look at um, cardiovascular disease because they've got um, any of that treatment or diagnosis um, recorded in the charts. And when they adjusted for those variables, the disparities still persist in these, um, in these later life outcomes. Maria Gleemore has uh, been able to see that there's a spatial or geographic um, uh, uh, flavor to these disparities. So you can see in blacks on the left and in whites on the right um, by state, these are um, people who die um, and have Alzheimer's disease on their death certificate. Uh, the stroke belt, um, people who were born, born in the stroke belt, um, regardless of where they died, they may have migrated to other states, but um, this risk is something that you really bring with you. If you're born in a stroke belt state, you're at higher risk for dying with Alzheimer's disease. And then um, uh, Maria Gleemore and her uh, team, um, along with uh, Rachel Whitmer and Paula Gilsands, showed that that um, stroke mortality state um, risk was um, uh, uh, um, with you even if you then moved to Northern California, worked in Northern California, got Kaiser insurance, and then um, were treated as an older adult um, in that Kaiser healthcare system. So those people who were born in a high stroke mortality state were at higher risk for developing dementia than people who were born outside a high stroke mortality state. Um, we also have disparities in other uh, areas of brain health. So I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the uh, racial disparities in stroke. These are data from the REGARD study. It's a national study of people age 45 and older. There's about 40,000 people who um, have been in the study at one time. And you can see that African-Americans um, are at higher risk for incident stroke um, compared to whites at all age ranges except um, the very later uh, uh, 85 and, and older. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, why, why it flips. Um, one of the issues uh, that um, really is a, is a problem for our, our research in later life um, disparities is that <clears throat> Um, there's a lot of selection bias in participation in research studies. So one of the common threads I think, um, I hope you've taken from the research I've showed you so far, is that all of these studies are population-based research studies. Um, uh, the, if you were to um, do your work on uh, dementia disparities in a memory disorders clinic or an Alzheimer's disease research center, you would think that it was flipped around that whites are at higher risk for developing dementia than are ethnic minorities. Um, and that's because um, Alzheimer's disease overall is a very, is underdiagnosed. Um, about 50% of non-Hispanic whites who have Alzheimer's disease never get a formal diagnosis. And um, that's even more true among ethnic minorities. So about um, only about 20% um, of uh, Hispanics and, and Blacks um, ever get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, even though they, they have it um, um, if, if, they're, if they're examined. So um, there are definitely some barriers to getting diagnosed and getting recognized, and that's why these population-based studies are critical. Um, the, uh, uh, we know that among the African-Americans who come to specialized clinics for memory disorders, they're more likely to have neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, irritability, wandering, paranoia, um, uh, than, than our whites who come to memory disorders clinics. So 
One of the things that causes this uh, selection bias is that there's a, a great deal of mistrust of research. It's not just you know those well-known classic research um, abuses, it's every day. Every day, um, people with minority background or their families are subjected to discrimination in the medical setting. Um, they are, I think most population, minority populations are aware there's a great deal of research going on and they see that it, it doesn't, hasn't um, helped their communities directly and, it, and disparities um, in health are, have been intractable. Um, and the other piece of this is um, that I think researchers um, uh, often give up easily. Um, I was in a talk um, uh, recently and a researcher stood up and said, we went to the Hispanic community, um, we gave an a, a, a informational talk about Alzheimer's disease, um, and this was in Texas, and um, as a result, no one in the audience signed up for our research, and I really um, think that it's on the community. You know, it's really their, their problem that they didn't, um, you know, come to us. We provided them all this information. And so I think that actually um, while that um, was probably an extreme example, there are many <laughs> examples of how um, researchers um, sort of misread the, the process of, um, of engaging communities in, um, in later life um, cognitive research. So um, this is Lisa Barnes, and she's a great colleague of mine in, um, in Chicago. This is from the Rush um, Alzheimer's Studies. And um, I just want to show you what could be the, the end game or the end result of some of this selection bias in research studies. So they recruited African Americans and whites into their um, studies of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and all of these people in this autopsy study were um, diagnosed clinically with Alzheimer's disease before they died. And then they um, uh, donated their brain tissue after death. And that brain tissue was examined. And what she found was that mixed neuropathology was much more common in African Americans than it was in the non-Hispanic whites. So this is the portion of non-Hispanic whites who only have plaques and tangles in their brain, um, whereas that, that portion is much smaller in African Americans and were much more likely to have infarcts or um, evidence of Lewy bodies. So one thing I want you, it's, it, it may be too small in the back, just to um, notice is that the number of whites in the study is 81. This is a very small portion of all of the white autopsies that they have in uh, Rush, and the number of blacks, which is the maximum that they had at the time, is 41. So um, over many, many years, um, Lisa did this work to try to um, convince African-Americans that <coughs> autopsy um, was something that could um, help research and something that could help us know more about how um, uh, cognition um, changes over time in, um, in, uh, in uh, older people. Um, so as I said before, um, African Americans who come into memory disorders clinics are much more likely to have neuropsychiatric symptoms. So it's not so clear that this is true universally, that mixed pathology is more common among African Americans than it is in whites, because this could be a small subset of all the African Americans um, who have Alzheimer's disease. Recently, um, John Morris, um, who's at uh, a University of Washington University in St. St. Louis, um, uh, put out a very interesting study looking at Alzheimer's disease um, imaging biomarkers. So these are people, um, not just imaging, but also CSF. So he did a lot of work to convince the African-American community in St. Louis that doing a spinal tap was a good thing for, uh, for, for research, and that was really a very tough sell. Um, and uh, they had been working at it very hard for very long. And um, they have a small uh, number. It's, it's, I think in these, ta uh, these, this study, it was around 140. I, 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 um, I might have it wrong. 140 non-Hispanic blacks in their in their study, 
compared to the whites in this publication, it was about, it was over a thousand whites um, had participated. So they compared um, amyloid. Um, this is actually from PET scans. Um, amyloid PET and uh, CSF tau. And what they found was that the two groups um, matched on the uh, amount of amyloid PET they had in their brain, this sort of um, amyloid uptake, uh, or uptake of this amyloid tracer, excuse me. And um, uh, however, the African-Americans um, uh, among, among the subset that were APOE4 positive, uh, the African-Americans had less tau um, in their CSF than did the non-Hispanic whites. So the conclusion um, of that study was that there's race dependent biological mechanisms that contribute to uh, this differential expression of Alzheimer's disease. So given what I've t told you about selection bias, um, I, th I thought that that was a premature conclusion um, to this study that we're not so sure um, that there are, based on this study, race-related differences. The publication also recommended, the authors also recommended that we have different um, cutoffs um, for uh, amyloid positivity or tau positivity um, across race as a result. So um, I think the, the, the critical nature of getting representative samples into this kind of research is, um, uh, is, is, is being shown um, right now. So we also have um, survival bias. This is Laura Zahadny, um, who while she was at Columbia as a postdoc, looked at the MIDAS study, this midlife um, study, national study, and also the YCAP study, this Northern Manhattan um, cohort that I've been describing. And this is a cross-sectional study, but she just did a median split on age in each cohort. So these are the young people uh, less than age 57 and the old people greater than age 57 in Midas. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and this, these are the, she says young midlife and old midlife. <laughs> and here are the young old and the old old. <laughs> In YCAP, they're, they're split at age 75. But what you can see in terms of episodic memory score in both studies, that the African Americans um, compared to the whites um, have lower scores at both uh, in both age groups, but that, that disparity narrows in the older age groups in both groups. And so that interaction was significant. And um, basically what's happening here is an age as leveler effect um, the hardiest, only the hardiest African Americans survive to be examined later in life. So when we see these disparities in late life, it's really just a, uh, uh, a, a uh, again, it's a form of selection bias, but um, it represents the, the hardiest people. And that means that our estimates associated with risk factors are going to be off. And that explains this flip that I pointed out before, which is that, um, in fact, at the older ages, whites are at higher risk of developing stroke, incident stroke, than are blacks. And that's because the only blacks that are left at that age are people who um, have survived all the other, um, all the other causes of death that um, um, are, um, that plague people um, <coughs> at the age. So, we would like to find out how to deal with these disparities. I think I've showed, shown you plenty of evidence of them and talked about some of the methodological challenges that we have. Um, but um, we need to figure out what, what, what questions in research we should be asking, um, what are causal factors, what are modifiable factors. Um, and um, it's possible that um, we can see economic and social policy as health policy if um, there is this, uh, uh, if there are these life core social factors that affect later life health. We have a model for examining disparities in aging. Um, this is Carl Hill's paper where he um, set up this research framework um, for disparities in aging. And he uh, laid out these different levels of analysis for us, environmental causes, sociocultural causes or mediators, 
pathways, um, behavioral and biological. Um, uh, this is his uh, relatively rectangular way of um, <laughs> describing the life course perspective. Um, and, um, and all of these factors, um, whether they are discrimination, family stress, um, psychosocial factors like social support, um, <coughs> interact with each other across the life course. But where to intervene and what to do is really difficult to answer because of all of those interactions across the life course. Um, we have, um, you know, it's incredibly important to distinguish some of the, um, the cognitive changes or cognitive distribution that occurs in early life um, from that that we see later in life. Um, because if the intervention should be before should be before early life um, in terms of prenatal environment or, uh, or parenting, then um, all of these interventions here that we're potentially going to advocate wouldn't, wouldn't make such a big difference in later life uh, brain health. So um, I just wanted to uh, you know, remind you of these, of these, uh, of these challenges. I think that the, the, they also present some opportunities for us. Um, I won't talk about measurement challenges today of measurement um, of, of cognition. We can have a whole other lecture about that some other time. Um, but I am gonna talk about the mediators, potential mediators between race and later life brain health. Um, this is Adam Brickman, who is um, really a, a great partner for me in um, at Columbia University, we run a lot of our studies together. So even though I, I don't think it's ten NIH grants that I'm the PI, PI on, Steve, but um, but um, uh, if it is half of them, um, Adam and Adam is sort of the contact PI for those for those grants. So we work together a lot, and he does um, structural brain imaging. And um, what he's found in the YCAP cohort is that. Um, Compared to whites, African Americans and Hispanics have a higher burden of white matter um, disease. And what's interesting here is that there's no interaction between uh, white matter hyperintensity burden and age, which is on the x-axis here. So because we're not born with white matter hyperintensities, this crossover had to have happened at some point, and it's probably uh, before we started doing our uh, MRI scans at age 70 for the YCAPS cohort. Um, he's looked at these white matter hyperintensities um, uh, and uh, looked at the uh, pathways with uh, <coughs> across race um, with Laura Zahadny and found that while uh, white matter hyperintensities are related um, to cognition in African Americans, um, more white matter hyperintensities, worse cognition, they're unrelated to cognition among non-Hispanic whites in white cap. On the flip side, hippocampal volume um, is a risk factor for developing instant dementia in whites. So these are people with um, a, a smaller hippocampus um, uh, below the sample mean compared to above the sample mean in green. Um, but hippocampal volume is not related to incident dementia in the non-Hispanic blacks in, in white caps. So this does um, uh, suggest that there are different uh, um, neural mechanisms that lead to um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease across across um, race. Uh, some of you may know about this um, publication by Tim Homan using a large cohort of African Americans um, who uh, who provided DNA for research. Um, these are this is a case control study of Alzheimer's disease. So all of these people here. Um, have clinical Alzheimer's disease, and all of these people are um, age-matched controls. And he found that the uh, Af and they're all African American. And he looked at um, genetic ancestry, so using the the, the GWAS data. Um, and he found that um, compared to the controls, the uh, the African Americans with Alzheimer's disease had a higher level of African ancestry. Um, and it, you can't see it in the back, but this is 80% here, and this is 79% here. Um, so it's not, it's not huge, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's statistically significant. Um, and um, one thing to keep in mind when you see these genetic ancestry studies is that um, genetic uh, 
uh, ancestry, global genetic ancestry. And we're doing some work to determine if that's true at the local level, local for um, APOE or other, other genes, um, is correlated with socioeconomic um, and social um, factors. So this is in the Health and Retirement Survey. Um, these are all African Americans, and uh, these are the odds ratios comparing the highest people with the highest African ancestry versus the lowest people with higher African ancestry um, had less uh, education. Their parents had fewer years of school. Um, they were less likely to get an inheritance from their parents. Um, they had lower income and less wealth. So really, African ancestry um, is a very good marker of um, these, these um, socioeconomic um, factors and of the socioeconomic status of your parents and your, and your grandparents. So when you adjust for these African and and when you adjust um, the relationship between African ancestry and disease um, in these studies of diabetes um, that were done in um, admixed uh, Mexican um, and Colombian populations, um, this, uh, the, the social factors account for the, the ancestry effect. So what we're talking about is um, the way that um, we appear, the, the uh, skin color, um, facial features, hair, um, all of those things are related to African ancestry and they are related to these um, social factors that affect health. Um, Juliet uh, uh, Colon in our lab is doing some work on African ancestry in the uh, Latinx population in NYCAP. And she finds that um, among, those, uh, among those older adults, uh, this is a composite z-score of all of our cognitive tests. Those with a low uh, proportion of African ancestry have higher scores on our, um, on our cognitive tests. And um, this is entirely explained by educational factors. So um, once we adjust for uh, quality and quantity of education, these African ancestry differences um, go away. Um, so I, I'm, I haven't... Uh, talked about discrimination explicitly yet, but um, Sam Liu in in the Health and Retirement Survey showed that um, everyday experience uh, everyday experiences of discrimination were associated with shorter telomere length um, among blacks. There was no association among whites, and uh, she showed that the mediators of this relationship um, were were physical activity, smoking, and obesity. Um, and Shauna Samuel in uh, a, a cohort of African Americans that we uh, have been examining in, in, um, in New York for an Alzheimer's disease epidemiology study, um, looked at the relationship between discrimination and, um, and performance on this memory task, the CDLT long delay free recall. And um, you can see that, um, that uh, when you separate out the group between uh, high school graduates, college graduates, and the people with um, graduate level education in this relatively high, highly educated group of African Americans, um, the relationship between discrimination here and cognitive performance um, is, uh, is a negative one for the higher educated black men, but not among the um, men with, uh, with relatively lower education, um, uh, educational attainment. And there's a pattern there for, for women. That's why I'm showing you the, the raw data here because um, this is not a significant interaction, but, um, but there seems to be a trend there for um, that, that being true among African-American women as well. Okay. How are we doing on time? Good? Okay. <laughs> I mean, an actual time. What? 9.36. Okay. We are doing good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, these, these are data um, from the YCAP cohort again. Um, the, uh, it shows age and immigration and risk for developing dementia um, in the cohort. This is incidence. Incident 
data as well. So all of these people were not demented at baseline and followed over time. Um, and what you can see is that the people who uh, immigrated at uh, younger ages um, into the Washington Heights area or from largely the Dominican Republic or Cuba um, uh, are at lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than those people. So Francesca is going, yes, <laughs> I immigrated early. <laughs> okay, all right, let's see if you are also um, impressed with the next part of the slide, um, which is that these differences are entirely explained by years of education. So since you have your PhD, yes. Yes. Yeah. Double yes. Uh, um, so I mean, we're we're seeing these. It, it's not that it's not that age of immigration isn't important. It's just one of these early life factors that has later life um, pathways through which um, uh, the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is 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 mediated. Uh, Lily Kamalian is, uh, again, another, we have this pattern, I guess, of, of sending people to San Diego. She's also in the joint doctoral program. Um, and she's looking at Amy Kine's um, uh, neighborhood uh, deprivation index in the neighborhoods um, around the hospital. Um, so we have addresses for all of our participants um, throughout their time in the study. And right now, here, this is just showing baseline addresses, and um, I don't show you the heat um, map uh, legend here, but the uh, <coughs> this, this is the Hudson River, okay, and this is the George Washington Bridge, and the hospital is right around here, um, and uh, guess what the, the blue colors mean for neighborhood, um, what? Higher SES. higher SES, so higher, this, this sort of summary index for um, neighborhood level um, socioeconomic status. Uh, and so if you, if you live on the river with the river view of the Palisades in New Jersey, um, these tend to be better buildings. And this is at the block level, by the way. So we all, our catchment area is, is all of this from river to river. And um, so uh, what she found is pretty, uh, interesting that, uh, and you can't really see it that well here, but I'll just explain that neighborhood SES is related to baseline performance on these cognitive tests, but not as related to uh, change over time. So just looking at trajectory of cognition, um, uh, people with, um, uh, people with lower neighborhood level SES start off lower and they have a similar slope over time. So this is just another um, dimension, um, neighborhood SES uh, that we're looking at in the YCAP cohort. And uh, Miguel Arce and Gloria Felix uh, looked at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia among the uh, literates and illiterates in our population. Um, so among Primarily, the immigrants to uh, Washington Heights, they're people who uh, never attended formal school. Some of them eventually, uh, because their, old, their younger siblings were allowed to go to school and brought back those reading and writing skills and taught them how, um, were able to attain literacy skills. Um, and so we focused on people with very few years, year, year, very few years of education, it's only zero to three, years of school were allowed in this analysis so that we could focus on the effect of literacy on later life um, cognitive function. And um, the people who were uh, literate were had a relative protection against developing Alzheimer's disease than the illiterates, but this did not reflect in a difference in slope in memory over time. So this really was an intercept difference, but not, um, not a slope difference. So, so that starts, I think, should start you thinking about what those diagnoses of Alzheimer's disease really mean. If there was um, perhaps a threshold here where people who start off lower um, on their test performance tend to hit that threshold earlier. Um, now, that doesn't mean, I think, I'm very confident in our diagnoses of dementia. Um, I think that we're not picking up on just, even in the illiterates, because I've seen thousands of these protocols, 
even the, in the illiterates, we're not misdiagnosing dementia. They do very well on our memory tests um, when they're not demented, but, um, and won't be called dementia. But um, that said, they're closer to uh, a, a, a cognitive threshold. And when it comes to interventions on disparities, uh, it would be great to find something that affects slope, but we, we sh could still find something that works on intercept and prevent a lot of cases of dementia. Um, this is Jamie Noble, who looked at secular trends in, um, in, in uh, dementia in the, uh, in the WACAP cohort. Uh, many of you have heard of the news that in several studies, the, the rates or risk of dementia is going down as people um, are born later. So with subsequent birth cohorts, um, the risk of dementia goes down. We found that in YCAP as well, and it's really striking in the uh, Blacks and Hispanics. So um, we recruited in 1992 from Medicare, and we recruited in 1999 from Medicare. So these, both these cohorts are matched on age and recruitment, um, uh, 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 how we recruited them. And these are the um, rates of incidence of dementia in 1992 for blacks, which was 19% of the sample um, developed dementia. And in 1999, only 10% of the blacks developed uh, dementia over the same follow-up. Um, for the Hispanics, 25% versus 17%. So this is really going down. Um, it's going down in whites too, but not, the, as, not, not as um, strong of a magnitude of effect. And what yet Vonk found was that um, when she separates those out by these birth years, so these are people um, who were born earlier from 1905 to 1920 compared to people who were born later, the cognitive trajectory is um, more favorable for people who were born later um, on, on memory performance. So uh, what she found was that these differences in trajectory and what Jamie found as well, was that those are explained by um, different levels of, of educational attainment in those cohorts. So um, even though these people were born in similar places, they all came to New York City to um, join, um, join the, the, the community in Northern Manhattan. Um, the people who, um, in the, the African-Americans um, who were uh, coming mainly from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia between these um, age cohorts were subjected to compulsory school law changes. Um, and so they were uh, forced, um, eventually not, not, not enforced, but eventually enforced to go to school um, for more years and that resulted in, uh, in higher years of school. In the regard study, um, uh, which is, uh, I described a little bit before, these are sort of the, the, the uh, location of participants in regards, they oversampled African-Americans and people in the stroke belt because originally it was a stroke outcome study. Um, we looked, uh, there was a, a great um, Ginny Howard, who's the um, one of the investigators in the regards study decided to at baseline ask people to report, to write down every place they had ever lived. So um, it was really hard to code, <laughs> yeah. and, um, but they got it. They got it all. And then um, we looked up the county level school quality variables um, for each county where people said that they lived when they were age six. And so we got um, uh, we got length of school year. We got um, attendance ratio. We got student student teacher ratios. Um, and uh, we were able to create this um, policy predicted school quality summary measure. And it changes over time and also differs across race. Um, what we found, and I'm showing you just data for term length here, um, but what we found is that there's a higher cognitive payoff if you attended school in these high quality um, school areas. So your length of school year was, um, when it was higher, um, as you had more years of school, that paid off more for your cognition. And I can say now, we're finishing up these analyses right now, Audrey Merchland and Maria Gleamore and I, that um, the payoff is even greater for African Americans than it is for whites who attend higher quality schools. So what are the implications of this work? And I'm gonna finish up. First, um, we have a responsibility to um, develop cognitive instruments that are appropriate for use in large cohorts. 
We can't do our work in a clinic um, when we're looking at disparities in later life health. So we need to have measures that are applicable in these large population-based settings. Um, selection bias um, is a problem, but we can leverage these um, we, we can leverage highly selected samples to develop some, um, some and refine these measures, but then um, we can't investigate disparities in them. Uh, we can employ weights if we encounter selection bias in our analyses. Longitudinal assessment is key. Um, looking at, you could see how uh, the incidence studies and the trajectory studies were so helpful um, in understanding this, and we really need um, life course studies. Um, we, um, uh, uh, the, the policy changes in school are our attempt to look at causal relationships between education and, uh, and dementia risk and cognitive function in later life. We can also embed uh, our health and cognition measures in social intervention studies. So if there's an income, um, uh, uh, increased income, um, we're looking at um, in regards, um, we, we hope to apply uh, the, uh, the food stamp um, rollout in the 1960s and 70s was done county by county, state by state. And so that's uh, essentially an income intervention and uh, we can see their effects on later life um, health. Um, I think I made the point that starting our studies in midlife is important. If we start at age 65, it's too late to see some of this interesting stuff with, uh, with disparities cohorts. And um, we are fans of using blood and, um, and uh, imaging biomarkers. I, I don't think I'm as brave as John Morris to try to ask for CSF, <laughs> but I mean, biomarkers are incredibly important to understanding the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the um, mechanisms of this disease. And I want to end with this uh, quote from Maggie Hicken, who wrote um, that really we've been um, operating under this model that basically documents disparities. And what I hope we can move to is um, an understanding of these systemic inequalities that really are in place to maintain the dominance of a single racial group. Um, so when we intervene, part of our national plan for um, narrowing brain health disparities and, um, and hopefully making an impact on Alzheimer's disease, which will um, be a huge burden in the future if we can't find a way to stem um, this, uh, this, this pattern, is to intervene on some of these social forces that are fundamental causes of, of disparities later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Special thanks to Dr. Jennifer Manley. And we are going to shift to Logan Hall, the psychology building, for uh, an hour's discussion. So if you're able, please join us over there and you can ask lots of questions and we can gain more insight. So thank you. Woo! Thank <laughs> you.